Hey, friendo, Steve here. And Larson. And welcome back to our Dark Side of the Ring Season 3 review show. Uh, this week we're doing the episode on the Dynamite Kid. Want to mention really quick, you might have noticed that last week we did not do a review of the Grizzly Smith episode. And so I wanted to I wanted to make a point really quick in case everyone's like, hey, what, what happened in that episode? Well, we didn't do that one. Um, and it was basically this. I know for me personally, I won't speak for you, but for me personally, when I watch that episode, it's a wonderfully made episode. It's an absolutely tragic story that is probably reflective of many families across the country and the world, unfortunately. Um, abusive situations. Uh, there was not really a whole lot of discussion about the wrestling aspect of things in that episode. And so then you're just left with a story about a, a horribly abusive relationship with a family from Grizzly Smith to his kids and whatnot and how that affected them. I kind of feel like the way we review things here at Going In Raw and just given my own life experiences, I'm not equipped to talk about that kind of stuff in a way that I feel comfortable relating to an to our audience. I would just recommend you watch the thing. It is a beautifully produced episode. It's a wonderful episode, um, but it is a tragic one to watch. And it's the heaviest episode. And I don't, with all the heavy episodes there's been, I don't even think it's close. I think this one is one of the more tragic episodes there is, mm -hmm. or there's been. And so we just sort of made the decision, you know, unless we're just going to sit here and recount all these terrible things that Grizzly did to, to his family and, and other people like it just doesn't it's it's not it's not it's not something I'm, I'm comfortable with. Yeah, totally. Totally. So. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that's why we didn't do the Grizzly Smith episode. But by all means, check it out. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Watch um, Dynamite Kid, on the other hand, uh, I'm totally fine reviewing that. Um, you know, in all these dark side episodes, for the most part, for the most part, I mean, there are exceptions. Uh, there's always a heavy emphasis on the, on, on the wrestling aspect of things, dark side of the ring, you know? And this episode has its own fair share of tragedies, including the central focus of a dynamite kid. Um, but there was a lot of, I mean, it was, it was directly related to to what he was inside the ring, which was a pioneer. Yeah. yeah. Um, and but also uh, how that his style led to his body breaking down, leading to yeah, you know, yeah. seemingly at least to some measure his 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 problems later in life. Yeah, and I mean one thing that we do here going in raw obviously is you know whenever there is humor to be found, you know, and there was there were some there were some hum there was some dark humor darkly humorous elements in this episode. Um, you know, for example, the, the, the whole story of the Rougeaus and, you know, the, the big thing that happened there, uh, Jacques Rougeau is a, is a, is a wonderful storyteller and his he's, side he's of a, things, he's a character, yeah. he's definitely a character and his side of things, it, even though it resulted in basically the end of the dynamite kid, you know, it, mentally he couldn't recover from that. Um, you know, the, it, there's, there's some, there's some dark humor to be, to be had there. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, you know, the one that the one story that I can think of that, man, this guy really did sacrifice his body completely. I mean, Foley says, you know, he, he sacrificed, he gave everything he had to the art form and that's what mattered most to him, unfortunately, and ended up destroying him mentally, physically, emotionally, and thankfully it didn't destroy his family members, but it did destroy his family in that he could yeah. no longer be a part of his own family. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think one of the, the more interesting aspects uh, of the end was uh, with his wife, Michelle said that, you know, uh, it, it essentially that could have been a lot worse, mm -hmm. but they made the choice to separate themselves. You know, yeah. he moved back to England. She stayed in Calgary. And thankfully, as you mentioned, it, 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 destroyed his family and that he couldn't be a part of it, but it didn't destroy the individual members. Seemingly, Yes, there was, you know, obviously issues that had to be overcome. And his eldest daughter talked about that 
um, you know, after she had her first child, she said that, you know, at first she had her child and she felt whole, but that only lasted for a bit. And she was wondering what was missing from my life. Still, it was my father. So mm -hmm. she went and visited him for a few days, uh, talked about how he apologized um, for what he had done. Um, you know, it seems like even though there is some trauma there based on on his actions, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, like the road to, to, to healing um, you know, it seems like that's at the very least in, 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 in the process of, of, of happening, you know? Yeah. I mean, for, for a person who had a shotgun shoved in her face, um, Michelle, uh, number one comes off as a very strong person and she's very defensive yeah. of his legacy as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. and a person in that position could very easily not be, you know, they could completely separate themselves and try to burn that legacy down by saying, yeah, he was crappy, but she always made a point of saying, you know, especially like, so there was a big incident where, uh, you know, he had, uh, thrown her into a closet. I think she was pregnant at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and that was a big he in trying to make up for that upon the birth of their, of their child, mm -hmm. um, their son, I believe Merrick. Yeah. Uh, yeah he went over and, uh, and above and beyond in being a good father. Mm -hmm. And she always pointed out that, you know, along the way, you know, you can take these individual moments and be like, oh my God, what a monster. But seemingly she tried to make a point of saying in between all those moments, he was a good guy. He was like a good person and he would treat them right. Um, and, and, and that was, that was very telling, you yeah. know, that she would make sure to say those things. Yeah. I mean, it seemed like based from her perspective that he was prone to, Extremely violent outbursts, mm -hmm. which progressively seemingly got worse. You know, uh, the stories being told after he left his family and moved back to England that he was involved in like bare knuckle fighting. Yeah. You know, yeah. apparently he had a lot of anger and violence mm -hmm. within him. Yeah. The latter stages of his life. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it seemed like when he was, again, this is from Michelle's perspective that, yeah, yeah, he was prone to extremely violent outbursts in between. You know, he seemed like he is from her perspective, seemed like he was, you know, a family guy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because it's it's one thing that obviously is no longer with us. And I've only ever seen there's I think there's like a whole compilation of shoot interviews. Mm. I think I researched this for one of the 10 for the wins where we talked about him. Mm -hmm. um, I know where, we talked about the, the 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 fight between Dynamite Kid and Jacques Rougeau. Well, there's like a whole series of like shoot interviews. I thought where it was like just like story after story of people just talking crap about the Dynamite Kid. That might have been somebody else, mm -hmm. but uh, but you know, there's like you know the there's I think there was like a documentary that they made on the Dynamite Kid, or there yeah, was like yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. series there's of interviews, story or something like yeah. That. yeah. And uh, and it's like when you listen to interviews from him, there's I'll put it this way. There is never any video footage of Dynamite Kid talking to the camera where he comes off as like a likable person. Yes. You know, it's like you either have wrestling promos or you have interviews where he openly talks about being abusive. And it's like, man, this guy's kind of messed up. Where's the humanity yep. there? Where's the person? Yep. And she does a good job of of making us illustrate. Hey, you know what? Because she's 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 very likable in this. The the, yep. the wife, she's very sympathetic. She's a very sympathetic character. She's very, yep. you know, she's still very uh, well put together in terms of. And, she seems like she has a good head on her shoulders, as yeah, opposed yeah. to just for example, um, oh god, what was the episode where? Uh, oh, the Pillman episode where his ex wife just seemed like an absolute mess. Um, you know, it's like okay, I can understand where this person's coming from. I can relate to them. She's speaking like a normal human being. She doesn't seem like she's on drugs or anything. Uh, uh, she is vouching for him. I believe that, you know, she yeah, humanizes yeah. him. She does. And that's, that's one thing dark side does a really good job of is, is, is humanizing as best they can. Mm -hmm. A vast majority of, of the people they're, they're talking to and talking about, or the very least giving their, you know, if they're, if they passed away, giving people an opportunity to humanize them, you know, exactly. and then you sort of make exactly. judgment yourself. Okay. Is this person exactly. Totally. totally. Is there anything, is there anything exactly. there, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And I, at the end of this, you know, she talks about, yeah, you know, he, he gave his body for his work. Yeah. He was abusive, but she brought up the concussion aspect, CTE, you know, the larger conversation of, of him putting his body on the line for his job and how that affected his brain. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of how he, uh, his behavior changed, she's pinpointed the, uh, the back injury and the surgery he had to have 
I believe it was in 1986, where he, during the course of a match, seemingly his back just gave out during a pretty routine maneuver. And he had to be rushed in for emergency surgery. His wife said that his fourth and fifth lumbar were shredded. The, the discs were tangled in his spinal cord. And then he was back two weeks later to drop the titles. To the Heart Foundation, yeah. He was back in a wheelchair, and then he came back to wrestle after a few months. That is absolutely insane. And the, I mean, the only context I have for that personally is when Lacey had her back surgery about a year. Oh, wow, it's been a year now. About a year ago, it was in June of last year. And it wasn't anything like this, you know. It was it was fairly comparatively minor, um, you know. She had a little bit of pinching going on, I believe, and and then they fixed it. But I mean, two weeks later, she was basically just doing the most basic of moving around, and a few months later, she was still experiencing the after effects, and she was not able to do very much at all. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine after this mess of a back is taken care of surgery being done 40 years ago, 35 years I ago. I know. Or no, 40, yeah, about 40 years ago. Yeah. And then coming back a few months later from that. I know. That's I know. insane. When I heard that, I was like, that's insane. Thinking the surgeries back then much more invasive. Yeah, yeah. You know, they weren't doing probably all the same stuff with uh, lathroscopes and or, right. or, or othroscopic type stuff. They yeah. probably are now, you know, um, probably a lot more in, uh, intense and bulky hardware, which mm-hmm. would decrease mobility. If you're mm-hmm. talking blown discs, you're probably talking fusions of vertebrae. Um, yeah, it's pretty insane that in a matter of months, I mean, like doctors, according to Dan Spivey, doctors say he's never supposed to wrestle again yeah two weeks later he's 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 ringside yeah months right. later yeah in the ring taking yeah. bumps it's insane it is insane it is i mean he he really was the perfect storm of innovation in a style that is really tough on the body and then you add to that going to the wwf where steroids was the thing and by the way there's some really horrific talk about the prevalence of steroid and drug abuse in there. There was, you know, Spivey was talking about parties where everybody would be jabbing each other in the butt with needles and then they throw them at the wall like they're darts. And he says, he remembers leaving. It was either him or Scott McGee. I forget his real name. Talk about leaving the party and there being like 10 needles stuck in the wall because people are just going around doing this stuff. And so he uh, got jacked. Yeah. And his body, the way he wrestled, just couldn't handle all that. No. It's not no. supposed uh, to. Jacques Rougeau talks about Di- uh, Dynamite Kid walking through the locker room with a needle in his butt still. Yeah. Just walking around. Yeah. I'm going to have a great match tonight. You know. Yeah. Doing your. You your know, and Dan Spivey just... said he was just he was like one huge muscle. Yeah. <laughs> and when he was in Stampede, he, you know, he, when he's probably, you know, 20 pounds lighter, 20 pounds less muscle. At least. Granted, the, the style he's wrestling. Still takes a massive toll on one's body, but you add that extra bulk. That's not <laughs> that is a lot to carry around. I mean, the, like one of the opening thesis to this is 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 he felt like he had to make up for his size because mm-hmm. he wasn't a tall dude. Yeah, you know, he wasn't the prototypical six six, two hundred eighty pound wrestler, especially that Vince won the WWF at the mm-hmm. time. And so he felt like he had to make up for it in other ways. And so he came up with this style that yes was pioneering, hugely in, in, innovative. But also took a immense toll on your body because he's over there bumping all over the place, flinging himself out of the ring, like full speed into guardrails. Yeah. And the thing is, like back then, you know, he, he was able to do that style a lot easier before he was doing the roids in Japan with his yeah. Tiger Mask matches, which were some of the most influential matches kind of ever. Like you look at NXT these days, and I mean that's that's where it comes from, you know, ultimately. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. I mean he would have thrived if he was born thirty years later. Yeah. Um and so, uh, so yeah, they, they talk about that, how he had to bulk up. Um, but then they would always cut back to his family. And, you know, his daughters still have his ring uh, entrance uh, cape and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And I thought it was so cute. They had, like, uh, the little uh, rubber uh, bulldogs action figures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, And they would use them as the Ken dolls for their Barbies. Yeah. And the funny thing is, like, the, the faces were such a dead-on. Like, they did such a perfect mold of the face. <laughs> It's one thing that stood out to me when they showed the dolls. Like, oh my god, it looks literally exactly like that him. That is Dave. That's, that's Davey Boy Smith, right? There. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. That's died to my kid. Um, 
but uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it always go back to like what was happening on the homestead. And there didn't seem to be any problem with, you know, the schedule with him being away. He would say and he would write a letter saying, I can't wait to have kids with you so they can take care of you. You know, there's this, I guess in his eyes, there was, a, you know, a certain which is apropos for later on. There is a certain comfort knowing she's with our family because I have to be away. The kids are taking care of her. I mean, she's obviously taking care of them, but vice yeah, versa. Yeah, yeah. Emotionally, she's taking yes. care of them. Yeah. Um. And uh, and, you know, she you know, she got emotional looking at that letter. It's like, oh, you know, she obviously still has a deep love for the guy. Yeah. Yeah. She says as much uh, towards mm-hmm. the end of the episode. Yeah. yeah. Um. But yeah, you know, the, the, the closet incident stemmed from, you know, they were out uh, uh, at a club and she was like, I didn't really want to drink any alcohol. So I just got like, you know, uh, a, a tonic, tonic water. water. Yeah. With some lime in it. And he found out and blew up at me, uh, took me home. And, and then in the middle of the night, shoved me in the closet. And then when our son came along, he tried to make up whether it was a great dad. Um, then you start getting into the Rougeau stuff. And uh, and yeah, like you said, Jacques Rougeau, just a magnificent storyteller, very just chock full of energy in life. And he would talk about, you know, I I wasn't a mean person, but I was arrogant and I would talk a lot. And I would. And it's funny. The recreations are great because he's like jabbing a guy in the stomach and he's like yeah, yeah, patting yeah. guys on the back and doing that whole routine. Like, hey, yeah, yeah hey, <laughs> the gun fingers. Um, and so they talked about, uh, you know, number one, that uh, uh, the Dynamite Kid had uh, a, a short man's complex where he'd try to you know, puff out his chest and be, and be the the baddest dude, the toughest guy. And they didn't like the Rougeau sort of rubbed him the wrong way. And I guess it stemmed from a match where Vince had them do a Broadway, which is a a time limit draw. Time limit draw. And I, and I believe Dynamite's wife, Michelle just said that, uh, he, that Dynamite kid felt like you can't get to the top without really paying your dues. And earlier Foley talked about where, where Tom Billington trained this place called the snake pit mm-hmm. where Foley pretty much says, I'm pretty sure he got the shit beat out of him every day. Yeah. And then he would some seemingly take that out on, on new wrestlers in the ring because Foley talked about where is I think he said it was a second match ever. Uh, he said, it looked like God my kid was just basically frosting, frothing at the mouth to get in the ring with him. And when he did, clotheslined him, but it's more like a, a, a shot from the bicep and dislocated his jaw. Yeah. Which, um, which, by the way, sucks. Yeah, I mean that just and it. I don't, you know, from anecdotally, from what we hear and what we see on Twitter, there was just an exchange the other day between like Jack Evans and uh, and Lance Storm. Yeah. Um, yeah where yeah. you know he was and like Lance Storm's know, in this too. Yeah, and he is. Yeah, he, yeah he, not enough. Not enough. Yeah, agreed, like agreed. you know, he was in it at the beginning and then he sort of disappeared. Mm-hmm. Maybe because he wasn't like really around all that much at the time. But could be. Um, but but yeah, I mean, seemingly according to a lot of stuff that we've heard and read. You know, wrestlers are a lot more, they're safer with each other these days. Yes. You know, they're a lot yes. more communicative, seemingly. There's a lot less of the there's duffel bags with guns and knives and drugs. Seemingly and, fewer instances of people taking liberties, you know? Yeah, right, right. But back in the day, that so just it seemed to be happen, the thing. Happen as well. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it was like part for the course back then. And uh, and I did appreciate that because here's the thing. When when I step back and I look at this and I watch this and you see both sides, you see Michelle's side of it, you see you hear Foley talk about it, you hear Jacques Rougeau, and it's really difficult to because Jacques is so charismatic Mm -hmm. to do anything but see his point of view, you know, I, uh, well, here, let's, let's, let's tell the story real quick. Yeah. People know what we're talking about. So the story goes, Rougeau's rubbed dynamite kid the wrong way. So, uh, the story is Jacques walks in the locker room. There's Mr. Perfect playing cards. He invites Mo to play cards. They're playing cards. Dynamite kid comes from behind Jacques and the slaps him across the head it knocks Jacques over he starts beating him up a little bit uh leaves so this 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 hurts Jacques pride he feels like he can't carry himself with any sort of uh confidence yeah in the locker room because he's been humiliated in front of the boys yeah um he said he told Vince he couldn't shave because he couldn't look himself in the mirror uh but he knew he had to get his revenge so he tells a story of he talked to his dad and his dad said if you're gonna attack that my kid go by the bank get a roll court <laughs> And Scott so McGee about, thinks that it was a brass knuckles. Yes. So he's, he, he says, I was waiting for Dynamite. He's walking back. He's carrying a cup of coffee. And he goes, hey, Dynamite, how's it going? Dynamite just does this. Pow. Clocks him. And he says, you know, how in the movies, when somebody gets hit in blood, he's like, it was like a river out of his mouth. Knocked out four teeth. 
knocked out four teeth, and he gets over and says, "You're never gonna fuck with me again." He says, "If you do, uh, if you do it again, I'm gonna put you in a wheelchair." Yeah. So uh, I was. At that, I'm sorry, but at that point, I was rooting. I was like, because he, the Dynamite Kid, started that shit. Well, there's another story they told about what's his name, Mitch Snow. Yeah. Where he was a new guy. They put a sleeping pill in his drink, so he passed out in his room. So then Dynamite Kid and Davy Boy Smith climbed over the balcony to get into his room, crapped in his luggage, shaved his hair off, and the dude like apparently basically had a nervous breakdown. He was so scared, went back to South Carolina, I believe. Yeah. I'm sorry, man. That though that dude had it coming. When I when that's the story I'm given. When that's the story related to me, Dynamite Kid had that shit coming, the roll of quarters included. I'm sorry, man, but you need to be put down, dude. You need to you need to learn your lesson. And then they're talking about, well, he didn't get to have his respect back because that just apparently mentally completely destroyed yeah, him up. Dynamite up. Kid. And it's like, well, you're a bully, dude. Like, yeah, it's like the prototypical bully. If it wasn't for your wife saying all these nice things about you, I, there would be zero sympathy whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> so then they start talking about how Dino Bravo, who had this was hilarious, mob, uh, had passed on a bit of a warning to Dynamite Kid, essentially saying if Dynamite Kid were to retaliate, then he and his family could face repercussions from the mob. And they asked Jacques Rougeau about this, and he laughs at first. He yeah. says, I did this is what Jacques had to say. I didn't like Dino. I knew he was a stooge <laughs> for the Bulldogs. So I wrote a fake name down and handed it to him and said, if I call him every night, it's fine. But if I don't, things will be taken care of. Yeah, yeah. So they all, so Dino's like, hey, this guy's got a hit out on you. If you mess with him, it's your family. So then Dynamite Kid gives us, tries to give his wife a gun and says, hey, our lives are on the line here. And, and they move. They have to move. And they move all over, all because this dude's just trying. Because he knows. He knows that the Dynamite Kid's going to escalate shit. And it's probably going to be even worse. Like it's probably going to he's like going to stab him or something, you know. And so he takes it goes to Dino Bravo and writes down a fake mob note. I believe there's a story too where they both have to go into Vince's office. Yeah, and Vince has to try to squash the beef between them as well. I remember that from we did the Ten for the Win episode about mm-hmm. this, with an entry about this. Yeah, and it's like man, I mean again, Vince in the background letting all this shit happen. Um, so no, so, I, I thought that story was, was hilarious. And it's like, yeah. yeah, dude, I'm sorry. You walk behind somebody and you slap them on the head and then you start punching them. You got what's coming to you. You know, you crap, you shit in some dude's bag and send them off. I don't care if he was talking all sorts of crap, you know, you, you give him a sit down and a talking to you, take him to wrestler's court. You don't sneak into his room, shit in his bag and not just shave his head, but his eyebrows too. That's too, you made him smooth. Yeah, it's too much. It's way too, it's, too much. It's, it's, it's way too. It was much. the so, ultimate. No, it was the. I remember thinking, I was like, "This is the ultimate story." If you play too damn much, I know, I know. Uh, so Dynamite left WWF after the 1988 Survivor Series went back to, to Japan uh, during a match. His arm gave out. Apparently, according to his wife, the, the shoulder ligaments weren't attached to the bone anymore. He had <sighs> surgery on that. Yeesh. He goes back to Calgary. He starts, you know, descending into booze pills his sister-in-law Brett Hart's ex-wife uh talks about how uh, he invited her over and just had her watch his matches against tiger mask Mm -hmm. yeah um and so one time uh dynamite kid comes home all bloody a piece like cheek (sighs) and just flapping around um and he was like oh i just fell down this is in front of his kids and everything yeah his wife's like all right i bought him a one-way ticket to england told him to leave he lost it grabbed her by the hair and dragged her across the floor again in front of their children. Mm-hmm. Tells her to leave. She says no. You leave. Kids are here. All our stuff's here. You get out. It's ballsy. So then he goes and gets a shotgun and says, you got 15 minutes to leave or I'm going to blow your head off. And she says, no, you won't. She calls his bluff. She, he points the gun at her head. Again, she says, no, you're not going to shoot me. I'm going to call the cops and you're going to get out of here. She calls the cops. Useless. <sighs> Fucking and they useless. say, and they say to her, if he says you can leave, then leave. Useless. She's there with a gun pointed at. Completely useless. Completely oh useless. Um. So yeah. And so then, she. So she mm-hmm. left. Yeah. So she left. He eventually. Uh, uh. Then that they start talking about. You know, he ends up going to 
Uh, I think is that England. when he goes back to England in 1991. Yeah, and he ends up because he the, the 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 Scott McGee guy was like, yeah, he was he was fighting bare knuckle matches, in parking lot and stuff in yeah. parking lots and garages. He was like he was in a garage like a dog fight, um, just to make ends meet. And uh, he came back in '96 to Japan for a comeback match, but he just looked like absolute shell of himself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you see him stumbling around and stuff. Um, after he's, that he's, match, he's so thin, you know. Yeah, I mean, he just looked like some dude who came out of the pub. Totally, totally. Uh, he had to go to the hospital, and they said, you know, your legs are messed up. We got too much scar tissue in order for us, you know, for us to operate and help you out. So by the time he was forty years old, he was in a wheelchair. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, and then the, you know, the, the kids talk about growing up without him at that point because he never came back to Canada. Yeah, right. Yeah, he never came back. Which I mean, you know. Like like Michelle had said, things could have gotten a lot worse if he did stay. And in too many instances with the domestic abuse, you know, the control issues are the thing, and they they can't help themselves but to stay and make things worse. And he realized, hey, for my kids, and they did seem to grow up relatively normal. I mean, one of the kids said, yeah, I had a dark period in my life, but uh, but uh, I think her name was Bronwyn. Um, she visited him mm-hmm. later in life prior to him passing. And she seemed to get quite a bit of closure from that. They had mm-hmm. some good moments there, so mm-hmm. that was nice. Um, but uh, but yeah, it was it was it was interesting stuff. Um, again, given that all we had really had before this is is a bunch of you know very negative, you know a, a very negative picture of the guy. It was interesting to, to hear him be a bit more you know humanized. Yeah. And one thing his wife said, Michelle said that, you know, prior again, prior to his back injury, granted, we hear stories about him, you know, taking liberties with wrestlers in the ring and stuff and pulling these pranks. But at least at home. Yeah. That kind of behavior didn't come until, you know, she said like five years, I think, after they they got married or something like that. after Back surgery. And that was like the first kind of turning point in terms of him bringing as what she calls it, his sadistic behavior home with him, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was it was definitely, you know, it had to do with seemingly his inability to do what he used to do in the ring and, and those insecurities that he would bring home. Yep. Yep. Um, so, uh, so yeah. And then, uh, and then that's it until September. Yeah. They announced September is coming back. Mm -hmm, It's coming back. So I think before then we're going to try to get, uh, Evan and Jason or, or, or at least one of them onto the show so we can discuss this past, you know, the first batch, you know, was in more detail and then preview, uh, what's to come. I know we've got still, uh, XPW, we've got the plane ride from hell. FMW, FMW, yeah. So, um, so there's some good stuff left uh, later on in the uh, early fall. So, yep. uh, yeah, join us for that. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. We appreciate it. This is going up on. This is we're gonna put this up on Sunday. Uh, Saturday. 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 Okay. Sunday's so we've got Im- so we've got impact later on tonight against all odds. And then tomorrow we got takeover. So, yep. There you go. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Appreciate it. Till next time. We'll talk to you later. Goodbye. Help support Going In Raw today by becoming a Friendo Club TV member. You'll get access to new bonus episodes every week, including Friendo Club Arcade, Live Power Rank, Vintage 10 for the Wins, and Ask Steven Larson. Get access to Friendo Club TV today by becoming a $5 and up patron at patreon.com forward slash Steven Larson, by throwing us a sub at twitch.tv forward slash Steven Larson, or by clicking join at youtube.com forward slash Steven Larson.